computer. All right. So again, thanks for coming out. Uh, we have uh, our group of people today and I'm gonna share screen again and give it another shot. Okay, so there's the presentation starting. So this is the sources of the material that is in the PowerPoint. I got it off the internet, so I'm not taking any credit for what I took excerpts out of and, and except for what we come up with tonight. Um, so cloudy nights, skies and scopes, uh, some blogs, and then a beginner's guide to choose the equipment. So here's the definition of the EAA, which like I said, I thought was Experimental Aircraft Association when it first came across on the emails. So what that is, is the use of a camera in lieu of an eyepiece at the telescope to capture and view images in near real time. The camera captures a sequence of short exposures, software stacks and processes the images to be displayed in near real time on a connected screen like a laptop. And there's also video astronomy, which is very similar, but uses a video camera rather than an EAA camera. So there's some advantages. You can see more than you would normally. Stacking of the image means that it can build a clearer view over what you would see in real time, especially for deep sky objects. Diminishes light pollution. And uh, the image works to combat the impact of light pollution where you're observing. You can use cheaper and smaller telescopes. Since the view is being electronically enhanced, you can use a lower aperture telescope to save money, et cetera, et cetera. And it's good for people with visual impairments who struggle with looking through an eyepiece for much, uh, many different reasons. And you can live stream what you're seeing. So if you want to, you could add or share your view online and connect with others. And I know that uh, um, the Revolution Imager has a wireless uh, Wi-Fi thing that you could hook up uh, people's telephones to your display. The disadvantage requires a more complicated setup than just eyepiece. You need an EAA camera as well as a laptop all connected, or there are some that are self-contained. We'll get to those. And it also means cables and power sources. There's additional cost for the camera and the gear. And it's less portable with extra components. Uh, you've got to set up and move everything around. So with the EAA, you're, you're uh, accumulating an image over a short period of time with the camera rather than viewing in real time. And you're viewing on a screen and you need software, either self-contained like in the Revolution Imager or there's other that I am not that familiar with that we can talk about. Um, the price is cheaper to add this type of camera than it is to uh, add a different type of device, or maybe even a, a, a nice ice piece or something like that. Uh, you can have color views, and it's easier to capture images with the software you're using. Got it. And uh, it requires external equipment, such as a computer or wow. laptop, or on a like the Revolution Imager, Imager it's uh, self-contained. So that's some of the background. Uh, for night vision astronomy, uh, you're seeing in real time rather than viewing a stacked image, but they're expensive. And it's either white or green, phosphorus or not, or just not in color. And um, you can capture images with a smartphone, but you will not be accumulating long exposures or capturing color images. So that's the night vision part of it. So a quick summary, if you already have a good telescope and a mount set up and own a laptop, it'll be simpler and cheaper to add an EAA camera. However, it requires more complicated setup of software plus cables plus power sources. Night vision, you can have a much smaller, simpler, more portable setup. 
and scan the skies, uh, grab and go when you want. And here's some uh, uh, references to go to on the internet for more details. So some other thoughts that I gleaned from some of the stuff. Uh, EAA allows amateur astronomers to observe objects in less than ideal conditions, especially under badly light polluted skies. Uh, night vision devices and CCD and CMOS cameras that enable EAA are also becoming more sensible, affordable, and easier to use. So that's a little bit more advanced now. And there's the aperture and boosting power of EAA. It uh, theoretically gives you on the same telescope, like a tripling of the telescope aperture as far as what you're getting for a visual observer. And I can attest to that on the, on the revolution imager. So Herman, maybe you could talk about this slide. I think that you contributed to this. Oh, yeah. I'm just saying that the, the fundamental des, uh, design that people are trying to reach is being is the basic underlying design uh, concept for the newer telescopes that are being uh, sold recently. The, the uh, Stellinas, uh, one of which we, are, we have in the audience with us tonight. Uh, a Unistellar, I have one of those. Uh, ZW Rowe has a, a, a uh, basic uh, camera the same way, and Dwarf 2, which is the one I have over here next to me, about the size of, uh, I don't know what, my hand. Uh, so the, the, basically, the, the complete design of telescopes for amateurs is changing based on what the EAA started many years ago, because I was a moderator on that cloudy nights thing for years. Uh, and it's developed to the point that now commercial producers are using the fundamentals, but you can still do it yourself and you can do it inexpensively. I started out uh, with you know, a, a simple uh, thing uh, and uh, moved on to this. Flatbed from India is typically man and double A M. Pardon me. Let me turn my mic this long. So, so the like I said, the cost and complexity. I think we're going to see a lot. If you look at the dwarf two uh, things online, most of these people have never seen a telescope in their lives, and they're they're seeing they're creating good Im images. Not wonderful, but people who know what they're doing who are using them are creating images that are as good as anything that I've seen coming out of a regular telescope. Now, the smaller guys, uh, the ZWOs and the dwarfs, will take longer to create that image because they are, they are basically smaller telescopes, right? The aperture is probably two inches. But uh, Stellina, Unistellar, you get you get an image out of those in less than five seconds, and then the longer it's up there, and it like takes ten or twelve seconds to have a color image, and to have an excellent image, you can see a great deal of detail. So sooner or later, the smaller ones are capable of doing that. But so basically, what's happening is what the amateurs started doing has moved into the commercial world, and. Um, I think it's going to make a significant change. Now, if you look in, if you get on cloudy nights and you go to the EAA section, you'll find that many of these newer products are appearing on there. And along with the people who have already converted their normal way of, of doing work. Greg, mute your microphone. Okay, I am going to take the um, presentation off. That's what we had prepared there and, and just open it up for everyone to talk about. Uh, we are being recorded. And um, let's go from here and see what we want to I, talk I, about. 
Yeah, I think many of us have started with a revolution imager. I did. And I, I started with the simple one, you know, not with the CCD camera and uh, with a video camera. And that that would got me started for sure. And again, so I Greg, do you have do you have yours handy to look at? If not, I've got mine here. Yeah, I can find mine. My my revolution imager. Yeah. Well, it's in the other room and uh no i have my okay then i have mine here so that's that's fine i'll just i'll be the um spokes model if somebody does the descriptions so greg and herman maybe you guys can talk about what we have yeah a lot of wires that's for sure I thought that was ragu. Got the camera. It's Wednesday, it's Prince Spaghetti Night. So that's the camera. It goes into the eyepiece holder. And I've got a, a focal reducer on here. I also thread in a filter. The hydrogen alpha filters in there. Yeah. Oh, nice. Hydrogen alpha. How's that working out for you? It's cool. Good. There's the battery. Batteries. Rechargeable. This is the UTC controller that controls the the camera. And then here's the display screen. And a lot of cables. And then there's a video monitor, which I think that I think this is not included with the original set, but um, it definitely is worthwhile getting because it's a nice display screen. It is, and in, in a, another uh, thing that goes on with that, you can get yourself a recorder. And yeah, this will record. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. The right. Monitor and recorder, because now you can take those pictures and process them. And then you got what seems to be a spaghetti bowl full of wire and cable, which I took the time to number and letter. So if it ever comes apart, I can put it back together pretty quickly. But this is the other key is to get the extension, right, Greg? Yeah. Because then you can then you can be a little bit further away from your telescope than that. The other thing that both Greg and I ended up doing is going to Menards and getting one of these cases and have it self-contained in here. So we just have to sit this up, set this up on a table, put this in the eyepiece, run this over to the, the box over here and it's ready to go. So Greg, can you talk about your operation because you've done pretty well on gathering images. Um, yeah, I can probably go get my box and and show it and do some rearranging here in the uh, in my kitchen because I have the extender cable, but um, it's just one piece of wire coming from the box to the telescope and the camera. Um, the 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 little DVR that you have that's what I take all of my images and videos with and process all yeah i process all of the deep sky object images that i take using planetary um stacking programs like the normal programs like registax and auto stacker that you would normally use for planets i do all the deep sky objects i take videos of with that dvr with those applications and a lot of people um uh, can't deal with that concept, but that's what I do. So let, let me go get my case and um, I'll come back in a okay. couple minutes and um, hopefully I can show you what I got. Okay. I haven't used this for a while, so none of the batteries are charged up. Yeah. If you're, if you're not using something like the Revolution or you, you're using a regular CMOS camera, Sharp Cap will do the entire process, automates it for you. So it's, uh, 
you know, from beginning to end, they have a segment of sharp cap that'll take the EAA requirements and create your images for you and save them. So you, you come out of there and you can actually see the, the image developing live as you would with an ASI uh, camera also with an well, ASI. I think that's big. That, that, that's one of the things uh, that I considered a shortcoming, shortcoming of the revolution. R2 was uh, the stacking that goes on. And I did not know that camera can be fed into SharpCat. Interesting. Is that the professional version or just the free version? I try as I know it's the free version. It's available. <clears throat> but it's, yeah, but they're, 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 those folks are using regular CMOS cameras, you know, and I think the new res Revolution Imager is a CMOS camera. So, well, the work. default on Revolution Imager is that, uh, as I understand it, grabs five images and stacks them with no quality control. So if one of them has got oval stars, your output's going to have five oval stars stacked. Well, the thing is, though, it 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 stacks them up to a maximum amount, and then it throws them away. Right, but the minimum is five. You can't say one at a time. The, the lowest that go that I that I can that I understand is goes down to five, and then throws it out. Yeah, most of these cameras um, go in small bursts. Uh, I think this dwarf uh, will do five to 15 seconds and you're then just continually add on and add on and basically get rid of the noise and all of the other stuff that's going on, the background things as it processes. So it, in 10 to 15 second intervals shots. I know my... Uh, EV uh, Equinox does the same thing. It starts out and you can watch it. It goes no seconds, then two seconds, three seconds. Then pretty soon you're up to 80, 90 seconds and then you're in the minutes and, and it's cleaning it up the, uh, it, it, as it flies. So, so I found my, um, so instead of showing you the, um, the box, I've got some pictures that I took that I could probably show if you wanted to enable screen sharing. And you should be able to. Okay. All right. So here's the same toolbox that Mark um, has showed everybody earlier. And this is what my arrangement looks like with, with the box. It's basically the same as um, the arrangement that, that Mark has, except here's my uh, bundle of cables over here in this open slot. And over under this drawer is uh, spare eyepieces and other things that I might need throughout the, the evening to help um, use the Revolution Imager. The, um, the object right here in the center in the little eyepiece case is the uh, focal reducer, which um, is pretty helpful, handy actually. So here is what it looks like when I have it going with my telescope and there's just one cable going from the box to the um, camera. So it really eliminates the rat's nest of cabling. Uh, let me see, oh yeah, here's a screenshot uh, I took with my phone on, on the monitor. So the monitor that I have, so the Revolution Imager, yes, it only costs a couple hundred dollars but the monitor that comes with it is, um, well, it's not that great. It's a monitor and it, you can make do with it, but it has a very um, horrendous side angle viewing capability. So um, this monitor was a um, suggestion from um, Jeff, um, Binocular Jeff, well, I forget his last name. <laughs> Benuzi, yeah, I, I knew it was a B, but um, this was made for uh, the, this monitor here was, uh, it's a nine inch monitor. It was, um, I guess, designed for RVs and it has a really great viewing angle from all from all sides. You can probably still 
find them on um, on eBay actually if if anyone's interested in getting this but um, it really helped me to get a bigger monitor to be able to get a better view of what you're doing with the um, the revolution imager focusing was super easy you don't need a batten off mask or anything you could um, tell whether you're in focus because you can see the donuts uh, forming when, when you're um, focused too far in or too far out. So focusing really is not an issue at all. The stacking that you guys were talking about earlier, you can stack it. There's options to stack anywhere between one and six images. So at the full sensitivity of the um, revolution, Half of, of imaging at the highest sensitivity, uh, the videos are taken at, I think it's like 20 seconds or something like that, and it stacks six of those on top of each other. It's, it's something like that. Um, it's not quite 30 seconds, but it's a very, um, it, it's a pretty long amount of time. So the reason why I'm able to get images like you saw with um whoops with, with this um and evens like m51 comes up really spectacularly in my driveway in st charles it's because the integration time when you're stacking six of these this is really like a three minute um integration time that uh and when, when you do this with a 15 second video each of the frames have that integration that's compounded over that 15 second video. So you have probably, uh, if you add all that up, it's probably 10 or 15 minutes worth of integration time from a 15 second video, if you add up that integration per frame. Um, at least that's my theory. I could be completely wrong, um, but uh, yeah, so that's, basically um uh, as far as i understand the revolution imager the the reason why you would go from if you're getting a great image when you're stacking six frames the reason why you would uh, reduce the number of frames that you stack down to two or three is because if you have uh bad tracking like your tracking is kind of challenged and it's not tracking all that well you go with a a uh, shorter integration time, and it reduces the effects of the poor tracking. And I've gotten images at Lee uh, that have three stacked frames per per image that you see on the video that are far superior than six stacked frames here in St. Charles in my driveway. Um, some of it is stacking. Um, I guess most of it at Lee is because it's um, a Bordel 4 sky. And let me see, the um, the focal reducer. So so when, when I'm using this on, uh, let me go back here. When I'm using this on my 8SE, this is an F10 telescope, but I've, from day one practically, I've really used this telescope with uh, f6.3 focal reducer um, in in my two inch star diagonal. The, the focal reducer almost got fused diagonal threads. So I just never really tried to un, unscrew it. I just kept with the f6 because um, for the last 30 years or so, my real telescope that I've had uh, for the vast majority of my astronomy hobby career is a 10 inch uh, F6 Newtonian with a galaxy optics mirror, which is I think one of the better mirrors that you can get back in the, um, the 80s and 90s. Um, so I wanted to keep with the F6. I thought F10 was too much. So with the, the, the whole reason why I'm going through the whole thing with the focal reducer is because when you put the focal reducer that comes with the revolution imager, into the whole optical train, you end up with F3. 
and that gets to be a pretty fast um, uh, integration there with the Revolution Imager. And uh, I'd say most of my deep sky objects were um, taken at F3 with that focal reducer in there. So oh, Greg, could you talk a little bit about aspect ratio and the zoom feature? So, yeah, so the aspect ratio, when, when, when you look at the sensor itself, it's not um, a square sensor, it's more of a rectangle. And, on, and the, the, the bizarre thing is some deep sky objects look completely fine at a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. But when you go to uh, image the moon with the Revolution Imager, if you check me out at some of the star parties, you'll see that I have the crop set up. So the, the Revolution Imager comes with a little uh, remote, which is, is sitting right here. If you can see my mouse on the screen, it's sitting right here underneath my monitor. And you click the button and you could easily switch between the 16 by 9 aspect ratio and a 4 by 3. So what what it seems like the revolution imager wants to display for uh, the moon and planets is the four by three because that gets a proper aspect ratio you can tell quite obviously that the moon's aspect ratio is not correct at 16 by nine but uh, sometimes i'll leave it like that if i'm zoomed in really far on the moon because most of the People at the star parties can't tell the difference anyway. But if you're looking at a, a, a more of a larger disk of the moon, it's quite obvious that the aspect ratio is wrong at a 16 by 9. So um, the, uh, the, the deep sky objects, and I can't figure this out. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. It's probably... Um, the aspect ratio is probably still wrong, but somehow the effect doesn't look as um, as great with deep sky objects. Like the picture of the Dumbbell Nebula that I showed earlier, that's got the 16 by nine aspect ratio and it kind of looked sort of normal, but um, because the sensor is a rectangle, um, I, I think it's the aspect ratio on the sensor is like five by nine or something like that. Um, it, you do have this issue with having an incorrect aspect ratio with the revolution imager. So you do kind of have to be mindful of that. As far as the zoom goes, uh, there is a zoom feature. It, it, so you can um, artificially zoom in, but you end up getting digital artifacts at the higher zoom magnifications that's quite obvious so you have to play the game where uh, you don't zoom so much that you can start seeing these um, artifacts which end up being um, uh, it's like straight lines um, also uh, you can move uh, once you zoom in you can move around uh, the screen a little bit with uh, some of the the zoom features and it takes a while to get used to that but in some ways uh, like you can see here in the screen that um, m27 is not really in the center of the screen well if you zoom in on that you can adjust the zoom uh, settings for horizontal and vertical to probably get that thing kind of close to the center so the zoom can be kind of helpful, but it does not give you spectacular images of Jupiter or Saturn or Mars. Uh, you can get images of Jupiter, Saturn or Mars with the Revolution Imager, but you'll, you will not get the fantastic planetary imaging views of those planets with the Revolution Imager. You can get good images of the moon. Uh, with the Revolution Imager, but um, you know that being said, when when we had the, um, uh, I think Jupiter and Saturn were in opposition like two years ago, and it was like during the pandemic after the comet Neowise, and uh, both Jupiter and Saturn were within like a half a degree of each other. 
I did take a picture with the Revolution Imager, and uh, that was, I think, the last picture that Brant Miller wanted to deal with me on, and he did put that on NBC. So that was a good enough picture with the Revolution Imager, but uh, you will not get really great details with planetary objects with um, with, with the telescope and Revolution Imager does give the effect of a three times greater uh, ap aperture of your telescope. I've been able to see a lot of messier objects from my driveway with Revolution Imager that I there is no way I could see those objects with my uh, with my eyeballs through an eyepiece. So um, I've used that to cheat my uh, my list of messier objects that I've uh, viewed. <laughs> so a couple, and, things, a couple yeah. things like that that I have thought as a good use for the Revolution Imagers, like at a star party, um, where you know you you could kind of pan the Terminator of the Moon, and it's displayed pretty nice on the on the screen, and then. Um, if there's a lot like an event where there's a occultation of one of Jupiter's moons, you could put that on there. Now Jupiter's going to be overexposed, but you, the event is, is when the moon disappears. So that'd be another good use for it. So this goes back to the to the live viewing part of these things, um, and also with the zoom, it's kind of fun to zoom in on the moon, like you're landing on the moon or zoom out like you're taking off from the moons. You know, it's, it's, there's a lot of stuff you can have fun with it. With this. Yeah, so the, so if if you're looking to get started in astrophotography, if you work with the Revolution Imager for a year or two, next thing you find is there's a lot of similarities between this and what you're doing with sharp cap and some of the other applications and now um i probably don't use it as much as i used to um the revolution imager that is uh, but it was fantastic at getting uh someone familiar with everything you need to do for astrophotography and i'm taking deep sky images with an alt azimuth mount which is another thing you shouldn't be able to do but it allowed me to to do it so um there's a lot of good things to be said i think about the revolution imager uh three hundred dollars is is all that it it costs but um so gone up. has it yeah well the camera here the, the dvr right here that was a uh, hundred dollars this is the lens that you can get. So you can screw this lens on. Got all it, yeah. Yeah, and um, put the Revolution Imager on a little tripod, and you can take pictures of the uh, your yard or, or whatever. Um, but yeah, so it's uh, the $299 plus the $100 for the DVR. And then the monitor was a, for the extension cord, right? Like yeah. So uh, the case was forty. The monitor here, I think, was uh, let's say a hundred. But it does come with a monitor. It does, but the monitor yeah. is not. It's not. Uh, the resolution is not all that great in the orig original monitor. Right. It's yeah. small. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been on on the hunt for a 12 inch monitor to swap in into this uh, toolbox here, but I seem to not trust Amazon uh, consumer um, uh, reviews that uh, claim that you have a good viewing angle. And maybe I should just go buy something and return it if it's not right. But um, Yeah, a big screen definitely, definitely helps.
So the, the weird thing with the battery that you were showing, Mark, is um, you have to turn it on to charge it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Make sure the battery power switch is in the on position when charging. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you need um, small batteries for the remote control and small battery, all rechargeable for the mini DVR. Yeah, and I was having a problem with my mini DVR battery um, not lasting that long. I ended up right. buying three or four of those batteries that I right. swap out. Right. Yep. And uh, somehow the Revolution Imager folks are the only ones with a battery capacity of, I think it's like 2,100. Um, or whatever the battery capacity that you get with, with, uh, with this guy right here is higher than you can get if you try to order this battery on Amazon. They have those batteries, but they are a lower capacity. So. Right. And the rev plus, pardon, batteries plus. I think that's what it's called. Batteries, batteries plus. Yeah, yeah. they yeah. have. They got it. They have batteries that you can't get anywhere, and they have it at a fairly good price too. I mean, I I was looking at uh, uh, those electronic supply places, and they have you can get a battery from those guys, but you pay for it. But batteries plus. Try there. You mean like the, the batteries plus the actual store batteries plus? Sure, yeah. Walk yeah, in sure. there and, and show them what you got. And they'll go in the back room and they'll come out with one. <laughs> I, right. I, uh, I resurrected a, uh, a light meter from the 60s that used a, uh, a mercury some kind of mercury uh, air battery or something. You can't, they've been, they're illegal for the last 25 years. They have, uh, there is a replacement for it that's an exact duplicate electronically that is 25 bucks, has no mercury in it. But Batteries Plus had another e electrical equivalent, it was $4 or $2, I think. I bought two of them. Try batteries plus, especially for those uh, little rechargeable ones that have uh, high amp amp hours, no amp hours. Yep. Anyway, Greg, this is a, a really good uh, presentation, and I, and the fact that you're you have a nice go to telescope tracks well attached to that thing really brings you into the whole. These that's everything you need. You need a telescope that will go to where you need it to go to, stay on target, and then you can connect just about anything you need as the the camera. But it's a good presentation there. Yeah, I'm I'm envious the way you set that up. That's that's really cool. Well, it's yeah. great. Yeah, when you only have the one wire going out to the telescope, <laughs> right there is a major. <laughs> well, that picture... a portable table. Well, the picture I showed was uh, the picture that was in the um, in S and T. Yeah, sky yeah. and telescope. Um, so let me. Uh, oh, here is. Uh, so let me. Uh, oops. Uh, That's probably one of my better pictures that I've taken with uh, the Revolution Imager. Um, Quite nice. And actually, um, here's the uh, Sombrero Galaxy that I took out at Lee. That's a good one. <clears throat> For what it is, you know, alt as <laughs> a 15 second video, people are not even going to know. I've tried to do is adjust 
the aspect ratio in Photoshop because I did call Revolution Imager to um, inquire about that. I don't want to consider it a complaint, but I called to inquire about what to do and no no worries, you just fix it in uh, post in, in Photoshop, so. Yeah, that's a good shot. Yeah, good so, uh... But again, the the tracking now in the, the newer products that are coming out as they start developing this up into the field of amateur astronomers, most of that's taken care of now. You don't have to do anything except turn the thing on, point it where, or have it point itself to where you want to go, look at it, it focuses, and then just watch. And that, well, I, that's what I, you got I, there. I, <laughs> that's the best for you've got there. Yeah, and that's a good wide field, uh, wide field yeah. camera. They, they 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 do panoramic shots too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's why I got this little dwarf for wide fields because my other telescopes has smaller fields of view. I've, I've been seeing good stuff coming out of that dwarf. Yeah, I have too. I've been amazed at the processing, the post processing. You know, I, I I've been waiting for this thing for fifteen months now. A year ago, uh, I saw Quinn uh, out at one of our star parties. Uh, taking photos using uh, a two inch lens uh, had hitched onto a ZWO with a raspberry and, a, mm -hmm. you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. And his, his photographs were coming out terrific. And I, and I realized it's that two inch lens is actually pretty adequate for getting, you know, if it's a good quality lens, I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. Yeah, sure, it's it's small, and an eight inch can gather a lot more light. But the eight inch, despite the fact it's gathering more light, is still an f ten, and the image is huge, but dim. Yeah, this is a an f four, and that's what Quinn was using. I think was an f four or f five, and when you have something fast like that behind a high quality lens you will be able to produce some respectable uh, images. The other thing that the reason that tip, tip, tip the decision is that this is a, uh, a back illuminated uh, sensor. In other words, uh, it's, it's a, uh, a silicon sensor, but flipped over so that the electronics mm -hmm. is all behind the image gathering uh, sensors instead of the light having to go through the, uh, the logic circuits. It runs cooler. There's less noise. The uh, the pixels are 100% uh, collecting photons as opposed to like 80% collecting photons. Put all that together. And this one, uh, this is a Sony IMX uh, 642 i think and it it has a, a really good signal to noise ratio very high sensitivity for the size of the pixel uh, uh what else uh, it just got all kinds of of, of new state-of-the-art technical abilities that that you can get in a silicon sensor so when i saw all of these things it, it's got a uh um, oh God, I, I can't remember the name of the of the lens. It's a uh, it's a flat flat field lens and a flat uh, image lens. So it doesn't need it. It itself is a, a field flattener or built in. It's a four it's a four element lens you've got on there. Four basically. element lens, and it, that's got a name. <laughs> By golly, I I've forgotten the name of it. Uh, but. Uh, it's got a great lens, well-made lens. It's got the sensor. It's F4. It's got all that uh, plate solving built into it. It's, it's actually an astrograph. Yeah. It, it's, you know, it's not a telescope. It's, it's, it's an astrograph. It's a camera that's designed to take pictures 
of the sky because it's all tracking. And because of the F4 plus that sensor, I can get away with a 20 second grab even on a uh, alt azimuth mount. It just seemed like an easy thing to decide to get. Yeah. The only thing I, so, you know, the only thing I uh, didn't count on was a year and a half wait time to get it. Yeah, I'm surprised. Surprised. At least you didn't buy the six inch, which was what forty five thousand oh, dollars. I've, I've got that on order. Okay, forty five thousand dollars. Yeah. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Pre order, I got it for forty four. Okay, deal. <laughs> they gave me a full thousand off. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. I had to pay full price. I ain't saying anymore. I, so I guess I guess what I what I'm saying is what we're what we're seeing and what uh, most of us participated in when we started getting things like revolution imagers or uh, on my guy my friends on cloudy nights started trying to create electronically assisted astronomy, not even knowing what the hell it was when we started doing that. <clears throat> but uh, it, uh, is that we've now driven ourselves into a point where the commercial side of this is picking up all of that. And they realize now everyone's got the software. We can make these telescopes do anything we want and uh, just get the least expensive mounts as far as the alt azimuth mounts are pretty common. And uh, and Celestron started using some of that in the way they build their go-to mounts. But, uh, so we're seeing a whole new whole new world of uh, viewing, observing, observing, because I got my mind to observe, not to make pretty pictures. I've and spent I, my life, I've yeah. spent my life since I was 10 years old grinding telescope lenses, playing yeah. cameras since I was eight, developing film, all that stuff. I've built telescopes, I've built mounts, I've modified telescopes, I've done everything that an amateur telescope maker should do. And I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah, you know, I, yeah. I, I want to have some fun. And I don't care what people say, you know, oh, you're lazy. No, I'm not. I did my work. I, I'm yeah. now... <laughs> I can I can see what something like this does. When you get right down to it, what what I have here is something. It's just a smaller version of what they have up on that mountain in uh, Hawaii. You know, Mauna High High Top. You know, it's uh, mm -hmm. it's got uh, an alt azimuth mount and it tracks and it does. It, it's all automatic. There's nobody pushing that thing around. That guy pushes a button. So what I do. I think a lot of the new telescopes are all TAS now. Yeah. And that new telescope at Adler, I think, is even um, a single arm like a Celestron 8SE. Yes. Yes. They're talking about putting a field rotator in, in, in the next version of this guy. Yeah. And to, to neutralize your uh, alt azimuth aberration. Yeah, they can do it with software, probably. Yeah, that's... Uh, what what you just said, Bob, is what I decided in 2014 when I got the Ada C go to because I I've already done all the star hopping. I think I need to do. It's time to just uh, click the button on the controller and just do it. I used to build computers because it was fun, and then one day I said, "No, I want to use computers. I don't want to build them." Yeah. Okay. I want to use this this thing, this camera. I want. That's what it's for. It's it's yeah. it's for two two guys two people who are entering and just want to take pictures and don't want to know nothing. It'll work for them, and guys like me, I want to see just how far I can push the limits of this thing. That's what I'm after. Yeah. Well, what I'm pleased what I'm pleased with is uh, again I I can go out for an observing session and see more detail than I've ever seen in my life no matter what the telescope I was using. I, and not only see the detail, I can see color. And and it's in, 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 and that's all happening within seven minutes or eight minutes. And well, that's how wide as bad as mine, 
you 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 can, I can't look through a telescope anymore. I have to have electronic assistance for my eyes. Yeah. Uh, e a e a e. So yeah, that that's what it's all about. Is and the other the other reason that I bought this thing back a year and a half ago was I was thinking that I would take it out in March or May for our public star party, set the thing up. You can have people walk up to it and link to the Wi-Fi yeah. Yeah. and have a have it show up on their phone and they can take a picture just like you did. Yeah, I, I've done that at our start parties and when the family comes up with their kids and <laughs> and all of a sudden all these little seven year olds pull out their phone and they yeah. say, Can I take and they're saying they're taking their pictures of M forty two and stuff like that and they're going home with them, you know, and they've got it. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So I don't know how it's gonna work in, in reality, but it sure seems like uh people will walk up and uh, there will be uh uh, M42 to developing, you know, coming out of the darkness onto a screen. And then I just switch over to the moon and there we go, do that too. And then we switch to uh, M30, M13 and, you know, whatever. Whatever's, yeah, sure. up, whatever's up in the sky. I've, you know, I've, I've started out public star parties with 45 minutes of trying to align my uh, AVX on the North Star and then and then tell the software where, you know, align the software while everybody else is just pushing their Dobsonians around. Well, take that, Dobsonian. <laughs> but you can still have to, you know, you don't no, have to well, do anything. This thing, yeah, this thing you don't have to do it. Well, pounds right a newborn weighs 12 pounds you know the the, the hard the hardest thing about this thing is to not accidentally turn it off turning it on because the button is on off button is so sensitive but you set it up you push it and then i from what i read i i haven't finished the instructions yet and it's still charging the batteries but tonight i'm going to take it out and and turn it on and see what it does yeah, it'll be interesting because the sky, last I looked, was getting clear. Uh, Which, it is know, clear. I, I can't believe, you know, the, the telescope showed up. I was all set for three weeks of rain. Well, that's what I had when I got my little dwarf here. <laughs> but anyway, I think, I think what we're, you know, EAA started of movement in astronomy now, astrophotographers don't like it because they don't feel it's fair. And so we had we had to put it in a separate section and we're not allowed in, in cloudy nights when I was moderating, you couldn't post-process the pictures and you, they all had to be straight as they came out, you know, and, but. What? Observing and and getting high quality. Uh, yeah, that was, that was it, Greg, you should, they weren't allowed to, play in the same sandbox as an astrophotographer who spent 18 hours. What's the, the definition of astrophotographer versus EAA? Well, that's, I, that I mean, the, the, are, are, are you talking about a guy with a film setup or are no, you talking no, about regular, regular cameras, you know, but trust me, we have two separate worlds out there. Astrophotographers are into the total art of it. Okay. And yeah, you, you never know what they did to get the image that you're looking at. It doesn't matter, you know. Yeah. So. Well, then you have the single shot DSLR uh, color versus the filter wheel people versus the narrow yeah. band yeah, people. There's all kinds. It's all, they're all... Uh, you got a separate group for all that? Yeah. Huh? A filter wheel group. Yeah. <laughs> No, I don't have a filter wheel group. It's you know, it's just that it's just that uh, people felt there was an unfair advantage that uh, EAI people, EAA people, were drawing out higher quality images in less time. There was less suffering. Well, that's not fair. Other at stuff. All. Yeah. No. <laughs> but that's well, that now. Now that the, now true. that the marketplace is moving in that direction, 
And you'll see more and more. I think Celestron is going to be coming out with some. If ZWO is coming out with one in a, a month. Of course, they've always had in the background, ZWO has always had ASI support. It was a full, the same as you get out of the little box that they sell. They were selling software. And you could use it to, to run your telescope, take the images, fix the images, process the images. They just, you know, it, was, it wasn't used a lot by people, but it it was uh, outrageous because all it's, it's the same software they sell on their little ASI Air. And uh, well, the Northeast uh, Astronomy uh, Fair uh, NEAF just closed down last week at where they announced ZWO announced a duplicate of, of the, uh, of, of the they, uh, Vespera here. Yeah. But it, it's only $395. Oh, you know about it. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's, you know, and, it's, and I, it, it's a clone, but uh, you know, I suspect it's made basically, by. Guys. Basically it's a clone of what Greg's got. Okay. As far as the single arm mount, but with enough software to literally put you anywhere and allow you to do with the same thing you're doing with the Vespera. So again, you 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 will have very very good pictures, you know, and everything else and good observations. And this is the way that it's going. Yeah. It's well, Herman, remember fair. when we went to that uh, the imaging conference several years ago up in the northwest yeah. of Schaumburg or yeah. whatever, right? Yeah. And what I got out of that was. That was when the first starting up of the DSLR deep sky imaging, it seemed like. Mm -hmm. And so you had a lot of people new to the hobby of astronomy, but they knew the technology of the DSLR and, and taking the images. So all you had to do was put a, a go-to scope in between those two things, and then they started to have results. I love and my then, right, and then and then you then you had the filter clips now for those cameras. You had the modification of those cameras. Yeah, I love my cannons. Back and then and then me. and but now you have this next group of imaging tools or visual tools, uh, observing tools, right? Right. And like I said when we first signed on, Herman, is that you know you need this stuff around here anymore with this light pollution almost anywhere you need it now to enjoy the hobby, unless you are still the hardcore observing guy, like I reverted to when I bought uh, the 15 inch from Jim Griffin, because I, I needed sure. something to satisfy my observing mm -hmm. itch, okay? Because the stuff, my eight inch F5, that wasn't big enough anymore with all the light yeah. pollution, it wasn't enough light gathering power. So I'll go through that and someday sell to somebody else in the club and keep it going. Yeah. I, um, I, you know, so on that, from, from that side, you know, if somebody wants to borrow my Revolution Imager for a couple months and play around with it, let me know. Same I thing know. with mine. You, you can know. have mine when as much as you want. And uh, like I said, I've got my four and a half inch Equinox, which does really good, you know, yeah. and uh, that takes care of my observing now. I got an observatory, observatory. I'm still repairing the observer building itself. But I got a, like a five inch tack sitting out there, which I use. That's the one I, I use for visual observing. Okay. And for the moon and the planets and things like that. But uh, Is that the only telescope in your observatory in Iowa? I got a 14 inch. Aha. Uh -huh. I knew it was something like that. Read. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to Pull it off its mount, mount it on a, a larger mount. So, mm, but the myself, observatory I'm... itself is physically having trouble. So, we're, oh. I mean, my project this year is to do some major repairs. Hmm. But for myself, I'm still going to use the SP <clears throat> camera and the six inch uh, Richie Crichton yeah. for doing imaging because I know how to do it and I don't feel like learning something new. It is tough learning something new. Uh, it could have something to do it? with once you get over 50 Dean, or something. Dean, you're on mute. You're on mute, Dean. Yeah, mute, Dean. You're on mute. You're muted. We couldn't read your lips. But, uh, 
Hey. You talking to me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, saw you we thought you were talking to us. We saw you. No, I, I wasn't talking to you. Sorry, I've got okay. company. Okay. okay, sorry. But yeah, Greg, I mean, you know, I am I learned the SPIC stuff. I'm happy with it. I still get good results. And uh, if since we don't, since we don't have the opportunity around here that often to do it, I'm happy to remember how to do it with my old stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, I have to really get um, squared away with the um, ASI Air. I um, I bought Andy's whole rig, I guess mm -hmm. you can say, uh, up to and including the um, uh, 120 uh, Mini for the guide scope. So, wow. Wow. Uh, wow. For you. Yeah. Um, good. Well, my, my 120 that I was using for a guide camera uh, is the mono camera that I use for solar imaging and I just didn't want to um, combine the two so uh, the mini has a smaller footprint in it anyway so um, but I haven't tried it out yet so um, I have to go set everything up and get familiar with it with that and um, yeah I've still got an ASA or I haven't plugged into my astrophotography rig and I'm having too much fun there with everything else. Yeah. Well, it's another set of um, things that you have to learn. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think in 10 years, 15 years, people are just going to be hauling around automated telescopes in 10 or 15 years you probably won't see any stars because of the light pollution unless something drastic happens well then you'll have all of uh <laughs> must satellites up there blocking everything that too. oh they'll have software to remove that <laughs> uh, everybody will be alt as they'll have that derotation software will be squared away um and ultimately um you you might be downloading the Hubble pictures every time you think you're imaging an object anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Well, isn't that the joke with the Vespa? It's right. Oh, yeah. That, the it, the, the, the images, images coming out of it that were so good. Yeah, it's a little too good. People initially claimed that since it was Wi-Fi connected, it was grabbing something off the internet when you went, when you wanted to take a picture of something, it'd go out to NASA, get a, get a good <laughs> Yeah, because then... And then Use that as a base for your stack. Oh, man. Well, the, the derotation explanation does not cut it as far as I'm concerned. What's that? Well, I, I guess if you're taking short enough exposures, you can well, derotate. That, I, I did experiment with that last a couple of years ago, yeah. trying to find out what was the longest I could take with my AVX before I had it tuned up to find out what, what was a possible exposure without moving it you know, turn it off point it at something and then take a 10 second 15 a 20 a 30 and just to see how long an exposure i could take and then map that against the focal length and you know that kind of stuff and 20 seconds was uh for uh 20 seconds was the sweet spot anymore you were getting board stars anything less than that uh you were getting more noise than signal i have I a question andy did that too now that i think about it yeah. andy andy had run some of those experiments and i and i backed them up on it That's so uh, he did that. i i have a question that i've been thinking about that maybe you guys can um can answer so with um deep sky imaging you take multiple images and stack them to increase the um, signal to noise ratio, right? Yes. Okay. So when you do the same thing with planetary, you're doing the lucky imaging because the integration time isn't that long. Is that what the difference is there? And you're getting more details from stacking multiple images on top of each other with planetary and like moon images? The signal to noise ratio on planetary is way different 
than the signal to noise on deep sky. Yeah, you can't say you're more, using. I think it's more of a layering issue. Yeah. Okay. Versus the uh, signal to noise, because you know when you go to process that, and you know, like on the, um, no, I lost my train of thought. But anyway, when you, when you go into the processing and you and you go and and do the fine, there there's a term for it. And it's just the opposite of bayer, bayering. Right. Uh, binning. Binning. Uh, the opposite of binning. Right. Uh, you know, binning, you, you combine a couple, well, the, the, whatever this term is, it's you can take two pixels and if you take the next two pixels right next to it and you put those two together, electronically or mathematically, you can combine double the, 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 the accuracy of those two pixels. It's 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 not real, but it's it looks it looks better. And I, I forget what the term is for that, but that's kind of what's happening when you do uh, a, a number of exposures on Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter is real small, and it only occupies a couple of hundred pixels. But if you take a bunch of pictures of Jupiter, it's not the noise that you're getting rid of; it's averaging out the atmospherics that 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 change things and also uh doing a little bit of this uh, mystery calculation and it, it's 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 not uh I, I can't remember the name of it yeah we we've uh, had such poor weather we forget all these things because we don't know i'm getting stuff. old you, know. <laughs> you can't use that excuse sorry that's not an excuse no <laughs> I don't know. I'm the oldest guy here, I think. Who is? I is. You are? Yeah. 77. Go ahead. You're kidding. You look wonderful. You look marvelous. <laughs> well, I'm small. Remember, it's always better to look good than to feel good. Well, I'm still up, still on, still on the other side of the dirt, so we're fine. <laughs> so I guess one more thing that that I'd like to bring up is, you know, what do you want to get out of this EAA? Do you want to get observing? Do you want to get um, images? And if it's images, what are you going to be satisfied with? So. Just like anything else, you could start at the intro basic level and not be satisfied with what you want. Depends what you want out of it, right? Because the revolution imager is going to give you a certain level. And then the, I, I don't even know the rest of these cameras, but each camera. Any, any, any CMOS camera that's made, you can use. You know, so. Right. So <laughs> it depends better. where you want to enter into this. Yeah. Just like anything else, you can spend money, you know, working your way up through things like how many tennis rackets do I have? Well, the, the good thing about EAA with, with most amateurs, I found out in, on cloudy nights when I was moderating there is they, they get to use equipment a different way that they already own. So they didn't have to go out and buy a lot of stuff. They just repurposed where the way they were looking at the equipment that existed and added a couple of things here and there that didn't cost them a ton of money to move into a thing that gives them a whole different perspective on right. how to observe. Right. So what I was wondering is if anybody that had, um, they, they were looking for information about this, like I think maybe Rebecca was one. Um, what, what, what do you think after you heard all this? You know, is there anything that we didn't cover? That you're well, interested Rebecca's, in rebecca's got a great observatory at home there so you know, that so. looks awesome you're right <laughs> yeah I, i'm impressed as hell so my vacation home oh that's your vacation home i thought so <laughs> <laughs> on your at your dark site right that's correct that's correct so it's been all very interesting um but i don't even have a laptop yet so i'm still building all the building blocks that i need to even take a picture on my telescope. What kind of telescope have you got, Rebecca? I have the William Optics. Um, ah, okay. 
I remember now you posted something. Yeah. That's a good telescope. Yeah. So I just want to, you know, try to get the right pieces in place to just take a picture. <laughs> so is it deep sky or moon or planet or sun? Um, all of the above. Yeah, the thing is, you just have to do it and just try something, anything. Well, just to get a mount, aren't you, Rebecca? Sorry, yeah, I have an AVX. Um, oh, okay, okay. You're all set. Brought it out in February when we had that meeting where we set up the telescopes after. Yeah, and before the meeting, right? Right. Yeah. Since then, I've bought a polar scope, so at that now, so to get better aligned. So I'm kind of slow <laughs> getting my pieces together. But. So that's where I'm at. All right. As far as I'm concerned, the reason I'm doing this is uh, uh, I want to uh, reach out, public public outreach, uh, demonstrate the, the skies in an easy way so that multiple people can stand there and, and watch it. That's how I got interested in the revolution imagery. Uh, but the wires got got to me. So I, you know, I, I've kind of drifted away from that. The next thing, you know, I want to learn about how the, the, what this stuff does. And, and I'm really interested in the new technology and just playing with it. It's a toy for me. And while you guys were talking about Celestron and what they could do in the, in the future, uh, if Celestron had their act together, they would be working on something that takes a Raspberry Pi and condenses all the wires into one little clip that you can clip into the aux on the AVX and, and clip the other end of it into a camera hung on the eyepiece and let the camera drive the telescope and let the, that uh, like a Raspberry Pi inside the box, do just what this thing is, except we're providing the chip and the software to drive them out. And I don't know how hard that would be, but it seems like they got everything. All they need to do is put it together. So I'd most, like to see that come out next. Yeah, most amateurs that I know have that are working with Raspberry Pi computers basically are just plugging in something like the ASI software or up or two or three other packages and they've got it. Yeah. The thing's totally automated and it's, you know, it, See, but, but I mean, John, is... I bought his ASI air because he uses raspberry Pi. He had it on order and he said, oh, I got this thing coming. Now I got my raspberry Pi all filled up with software and it's working. So why should I put the other thing on? So I, I guess why I bought that then. I'm visualizing a box with two wires. Inside is the is whatever Raspberry Pi and software, plate solving and and uh, 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 star sense and everything, and you just plug it into the mount and you plug the other end into the back of the camera, which is uh, promised. You know, you click, put the camera inside the telescope, and then you turn it on and it, tell it a couple of things where you are and then it goes and plate solves figures out where it is and then asks you what do you want to look at two wires you know not 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 a raspberry pi and look, look to the left pi. look to your left and you don't even need wires i know You're that's doing it wireless the difference between this thing right now and the box i'm describing is you take the lens out of this box I actually just take all the software out of this box with the camera and an interface that goes over to my AVX. Plug those two things uh, together. And instead of driving a little, a little Tic Tac, it drives an AVX. Mm -hmm. Why couldn't it do that? And Celestron, since it has all that proprietary interface and stuff, they're the only ones 
that could make that little silver box that drives an AVX or uh, the Altaz. But like I said, I, I think a couple of our own people have designed those boxes for their Celestrons and whatever mounts they're using. And they just put their own software in. It's not that, you know, it's not that crippling. Now, yeah. it's not That's making too hard. <clears throat> okay. Too hard, man. <laughs> <laughs> plug, plug. That's it. I'm done. And I want to tell it to go show me stuff. Yeah, that's what the ASA Air does. Yeah. And, and imagine I've got a I've got an uh, a C8 sitting there on an AVX, which has been hyper tuned and all that kind of stuff. All I need to do is line it up on the North Star, and it'll take care of it. it, it, it this thing even uh uh between pictures tunes up its its guidance you know at least yeah, that's speaking, what they of, speaking of guiding and do any of these new technology cameras self-guiding or how is the guiding done the uh the when it, 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 self every 20 seconds it takes when it finishes a picture i think it checks to make sure where that it's still looking where it thought it was yeah they're all I, but i don't really know I, I don't know yet. I'm, I'm, I'll be finding out. The thing continuously guides itself. So once it's played solid to it and finds out where it's going. Yeah. From that point on, once it has the finds out the first time at night, it'll go everywhere right where you expect it to go and stay there until you have to go away. It's what fun is that? What fun is that? That cuts it's down on your vocabulary during the night. Great fun. Great fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that your experience with the dwarf? I haven't used the dwarf yet, but my larger, my larger one, the Equinox, that thing just goes. You know, oh, that's right. you've got the Equinox too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that one looks pretty good. <sighs> hmm. Anything else today? I will uh, add to that PowerPoint. I'll go through the recording of this and add some stuff onto there and then uh, publish the PowerPoint and download or upload the, the recording of this. Anybody else want to have a subject or have a question or? Okay. Well, I might add that it was Herman when he brought his Equinox. It was a year ago. Yeah. That's what that was the thing that tipped me over. I knew all these other facts about this. And then I saw what Herman was doing. I went, I gotta get one too. And then I found out about the tic tac. Okay, I am going to miss the public star party. Al is hosting that. And if it happens to be clear enough for telescopes, there's a reminder, go down to the far southwest side of the parking lot to get away from that main light across the street. There's a couple of street level spotlights on their welcome board out by the athletic center that just come right across into the parking lots all right